Can you hear us, Mr. Miller? All right. Um, for some reason, I can't hear him. But he can hear you? Uh, yes, he can hear us. We, yeah. Uh, let's see if we can get you playing through here. All right. Um. Could you talk really quickly? Yeah. Oh, hello. Got you very low. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. It's just very low. We're going to try to figure that out really quickly. Could you give me a quick test one, two, test one, two? Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Perfect. Uh, should I keep my video on? Uh, yeah. Do y'all want the video on? He'll, so he can be on Facebook Live, yes. Alright. Okay. I apologize for the lighting here. I have to be outside. Camera's good? Uh, yes, and I'm about to send you a lot of things I have over here. Uh, can Mr. Miller hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So let me just get, tell you a little bit of what, what we're doing while he uh, sets it up, Mr. Miller. Uh, or do, can I call you Wesley? <laughs> yeah, Wesley or Wes, Wes. Uh, whatever's fine. Okay. So uh, during the program, we're going to take about two or three breaks, like little four-minute breaks, so that we can regroup and, and talk to you without, uh, without the audience listening. Okay. So um, I'm going to start uh, just by asking you um, – to introduce yourself, and and then we're going to go into uh, the article, and we'll just have a conversation, uh, not to worry about, you know, scripting or anything. We're just going to have fun with the conversation, and you have some real valuable information to share. Okay, great. All right, perfect. How detailed of an introduction are you looking for? Uh, not too detailed. Uh, just you know, briefly, what what you do at the real estate center, and and uh, I understand by reading that you're a uh, you're a PhD student there. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about tell our audience about that as well. Okay. And how you uh, well, I'll ask you later how. Uh, From listeners like you. Hey, this is Leticia. And this is Matt. Catch us on the Reba Show every Tuesday from 2 to 3. On our show, you'll be able to hear from the experts everything about home ownership. Tune in on Tuesdays at 2 on the Blue Stream. On FishbowlRadioNetwork.com. Jump in.
Now, during this pandemic that we're in, today is August 4th, and we're still in the middle of this pandemic. And so it intrigued me because, you know, this show is about home ownership, and uh, we talk about ways to prepare, and, and then the pandemic hits, and we can't help but talk about rental and residential rental protection. So I would thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be with us. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am a research associate at the Real Estate Center at Texas A&M and am also a PhD economic student at Texas A&M. So uh, got my Aggie shirt on, as you can see, hopefully don't ruffle too many feathers up there. And uh, <laughs> but I, I'm sure there's some Aggies up there, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and uh, so um, my work at both in the economics department and at the Real Estate Center uh, kind of go hand in hand together. Um, but right now, I'm prim prim primarily focusing on this issue of evictions, and obviously, that's come to the forefront of uh, the, really the national discussion and um, how should we respond to uh, this issue that's going on with uh, the, the pandemic right now. Exactly. It's a very serious issue. And as we speak, uh, there's still deliberation, right, Sal, with, with, with Congress. And I mean, the, the whole thing as to whether we should extend it. It's Before. Up in the air. Exactly. So before we get there, uh, tell me about your article talks, I mean, has some really, really great points. Uh, you're saying that it, this, this pandemic is going to have reverberating effects on individuals and society. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so there's a couple different avenues you can look at that. So one is just thinking about the consequences of those that end up being evicted. So uh, there's still, this is a growing uh, body of work and research across uh, multiple disciplines. We still don't have a great understanding, but one thing we do know is that when someone has an eviction on their record, it's, it's difficult for them to, uh, to rent in the future because that's often a screening question that's used uh, for property management companies and, and uh, multifamily housing is it, have you had a, a prior eviction? And so sometimes those applicants will be thrown you know, into the trash, uh, their applications will, and so that that uh, is an automatic barrier, direct barrier to uh, or I issue for uh, evictees. Now, on the other hand, uh, an interesting stat I actually learned from from writing this paper is that three out of four landlords are actually small businesses, mom and pop places that are just rent renting out, you know, a house or two on the side. Um, for some passive income. So obviously, uh, it's not really that big corporation that you're thinking about that, you know, may be able to shoulder some of the burden in, in terms of if rents aren't paid on time. A lot of these are individuals and homeowners themselves that have mortgage payments and, and uh, you know, bills to pay uh, that don't have a big cushion that they can fall onto. So, uh, so that said, any, any relief that is provided wherever on the spectrum can can reverberate throughout the financial system in terms of you know from the landlords to the uh, you know to those that are providing the, the mortgages and uh, all the way through the system. So you're saying like the servicers, the, it trickles down the servicers, the owners, the renters. Uh, yeah. So and then and then even it can have long term structural effects. And, you know, the decisions of the type of relief that our policymakers decide to implement during this crisis is going to play in people's minds, you know, and for future multifamily housing development. They want to see, you know, what's the political landscape um, going to be like if we are faced with something similar? It doesn't have to be another pandemic, but just kind of gauging the appetite of, of what society and politicians are feeling about uh, multi-family multi -family housing and, and renter protection and, and all these different policies. Uh, you know, so it, it, right now it's just there's a lot of moving parts and people are just soaking it in to see what's going to happen and what's the response going to be. Well, a lot of renters are voters, so our politicians better be listening. Sure, yeah. I mean, that's definitely makes up a, a, a large proportion of, of their constituency. And, and I think... Uh, I, I go into this in, into the paper, and one thing, that, another thing that's interesting is, you know, one of the initial responses nationwide was providing a, a forbearance or, a, you know, an, a, a moratorium on foreclosures and evictions for for households, and, and the mechanism that they uh, that was that enabled that was 
uh, federally backed mortgages through uh, Fannie Mae and, and uh, Freddie Mac. Well, there's no such system that uh, that exists really for the multifamily housing sector. So, uh, you know, it's easy to look at this and say, you know, the federal government came through and provided assistance for homeowners, but what about the renters? Uh, but the thing is, there wasn't a mechanism that they could easily do that. And that's why you've seen different cities and different states and all these different jurisdictions, uh, you know, have to come up with with ideas on their own. And that's what we're seeing right now. So question regarding uh, the mortgage backed securities. And uh, so FHA does finance multifamilies in upwards of 5, 20, 30, 100 units. So because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, there is some kind of protection for the renters there because they are these loans may be financed through a government program. Yeah, so uh, th that's that's completely correct, and it's that's a, a significant portion of renters. Uh, I think the latest estimates I saw were about it's about thirty percent. So thirty percent of renters will have similar type protection that homeowners were seeing through that uh, through the CARES Act. I think that was through, uh, but then you so you still have seventy percent. I mean upwards of. 30 million renters that that don't have protection through that because their their multifamily housing uh, unit isn't backed by a, fe um, a federally backed mortgage right, finance heard, backed mortgage. I heard there's six thousand six million uh, residents in in Texas and uh, one out of five. What is it? One out of five or two out of five uh, are renting. Is that an accurate number or? I don't have those numbers in, in front of me, um, but uh, so, so you said two out of five households are renters? Yes. That's something that uh, I, I read a while back, so uh, it just it just came back to mind right now. <laughs> yeah, I don't have those uh, those numbers in, in front of me right now, but um, yeah, that's, that's unsurprising. I mean, a, a substantial portion of the population is uh, composed of renter households, and then in the article we go in and talk about just some some brief differences between those two populations as well, renter and, and homeowning. Okay, so I think the takeaway from this uh, conversation that we're having so far is that uh, communication is really, really important. Communication between the landlord, the tenant, uh, to so they both on the same page, right? Because neither one of them uh, wants to lose in this situation. And so uh, that's really important. So, so tell me, Wes, how did how did Texas respond w with local locally? Well, well, first Texas um, implemented a, a statewide moratorium on evictions, and that was in uh, late March, I believe. And that was uh, the, all of these policies have been adjusted and extended. So, um, I believe the initial uh, policy was for uh, 30 days and then extended to 60 days. Uh, so that was a statewide response. I believe that when that expired, the uh, individual cities and counties have, have uh, you know, differentiated in their response. Uh, the last I saw, Travis County extended their moratorium through September. Um, and uh, But it's not just uh, differences in, in dates of when the moratoria take place, but also intricacies and details. For example, in Travis County, I believe it's a moratorium on um, even notices of eviction notices. So that's the first part that starts the eviction process. And in some places, you are still able to file for an eviction, but none of the uh, cases would be heard in court. So there's there, that's why we're saying there's a patchwork you know, of policies across the state uh, because everybody's uh, just trying to figure out and respond as best they can. And, and again, they're, they're balancing this issue of protecting renters, uh, these renter households that may not be able to pay rent because of this pandemic. And also uh, on the other end, landlords that have their own bills to pay that, that are dependent on that income. Very good. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, uh, Wes, let's talk about uh, a little more about really what's what's what the devastation that this can cause if it's not fixed and fixed soon. Um, one of them, homelessness. Uh, and so let's take a quick break. When we come back from break, let's continue our conversation. If you'd like to be part of the conversation or have a question, please call us, area code 214-431-5032. We'd love to hear your questions uh, for Mr. Wesley Miller. We'll be back in just a moment. Hey. 
Hey, this is Leticia. And this is Matt. Catch us on the Reba Show every Tuesday from 2 to 3. On our show, you'll be able to hear from the experts everything about home ownership. Tune in on Tuesdays at 2 on the Blue Stream. On FishbowlRadioNetwork.com. Jump in. Leticia. I've been a realtor for 15 years and we bring you information from the experts. And I'm Sal. I'm the co-host. I'm a loan officer for the past 20 plus years. And we're with the Reba Show. Homeownership, hear it from the experts. And here on the Reba Show, we bring experts in the respective field to give you information as to the home buying process, if you're uh, sustaining your home or if you're looking to sell your home covering all the industry, lenders, realtors, title company, escrow officers, insurance agents, all volunteering their time to bring you information that you can use. Our guests are experts when it comes to home ownership, whether you're buying for the first time or whether you're maintaining or sustaining the home you currently have. Or selling. Home ownership, hear it from the experts in the Blue Stream. Jump in. Programming for the Reba Show is proudly underwritten in part by the Arlington Tomorrow Foundation, contributing to a thriving Arlington, and in part by the Texas Association of Realtors Housing Opportunity Foundation. Funding is also provided by generous donations from listeners like you. Hey, this is Leticia. And this is Matt. Catch us on the Reba Show every Tuesday from 2 to 3. On our show, you'll be able to hear from the experts everything about home ownership. Tune in on Tuesdays at 2 on the Blue Stream. On FishbowlRadioNetwork.com. Jump in. Hey, I'm Leticia. I've been a realtor for 15 years, and we bring you information from the experts. And I'm Sal. I'm the co-host. I'm a loan officer for the past 20 plus years. And we're with the Reba Show. Homeownership, hear it from the experts. And here on the Reba Show, we bring experts in the respective field to give you information as to the home buying process, if you're uh, sustaining your home, or if you're looking to sell your home covering all the industry, lenders, realtors, title company, escrow officers, insurance agents, all volunteering their time to bring you information that you can use. Our guests are experts when it comes to home ownership, whether you're buying for the first time or whether you're maintaining or sustaining the home you currently have. Or selling. Home ownership, hear it from the experts in the Blue Stream. Jump in. Programming for the Reba Show is proudly underwritten in part by the Arlington Tomorrow Foundation, contributing to a thriving Arlington, and in part by the Texas Association of Realtors Housing Opportunity Foundation. Funding is also provided by generous donations from listeners like you. Hey, this is Leticia. And this is Matt. Catch us on The Reba Show every Tuesday from 2 to 3. On our show, you'll be... The Reba Show, home ownership. Hear it from the experts. Live from Fishbowl Radio Network at Globe Life Park, Arlington, Texas. The American Dream City. My name's Leticia Gallegos. And co-hosting with me today... Is Sal Villalobos. Thank you all for joining us. Our special guest today via Zoom is Wesley Miller with the Real Estate Center at a and University. And um, if you uh, missed our first segment, you missed a lot of great information, go back and, and listen to it on our podcast or listen to it on our Facebook Live on uh, the Reba Show Facebook page. So uh, continuing with our conversation, uh, first listeners, if you, wanted, if you have a question, please call us. The number is 214-431-5032. So, Wesley, 
all this started, I mean, we, we know that the effects on renters has been, has been more of an effect than on homeowners. Um, you know, we, on this show, we talk about home ownership and we, we, we help people prepare for home ownership. But the reality is that there, are, you know, about 30% or so of renters are, have been affected uh, from this, or there's, maybe that's a different number, but anyway, 30% or so. So, so t let's go back to the initial, when it initially started to happen. So the initial impact of the shutdown, tell us more about that. Yes, yeah, so that's really important in understanding why uh, policymakers rushed to support renters, because uh, when when we had the when the government shut down, uh, obviously there was a um, you know a host of, of layoffs. And uh, analyzing it for for Texas, the um, unemployment unemployment claims, initial unemployment claims, these layoffs were highly concentrated in industries that uh, that contain a lot of renter households. So for example, everybody has, uh, you know, off the top of their head, restaurants have really been hurting. Well, the accommodation and food services industry uh, laid off 170,000, or there was a, a 170,000 initial unemployment insurance claims just in the first uh, two or three weeks um, in, uh, in April, at the end of it, uh, March and, and early April. And that industry, uh, accommodation and food services, about two thirds of those employees are uh, renter households. So, and that's the highest concentration of all the industries. There's uh, a list of 20 that are categorized. Other ones on there are uh, retail trade and uh, health and social assistance, arts, uh, entertainment and recreation. So all these service industries that you know we've got on the top of our head that we unfortunately can't go out and enjoy as consumers, uh, those are the industries that were hit the hardest initially and, are, and actually are still being hit the hardest Looking at um, initial unemployment claims uh, through July, these industries are still being hit the hardest uh, in terms of layoffs, and they have the highest proportion of renter households. So that kind of explains some of the initial rush to uh, support these um, these industries or, or these households, renters in, in uh, uh, specifically, because policymakers identified that you know this is where the initial impact was going to hit. Okay, not to mention. Um housing, uh, uh, city housing, uh, what am I looking, the, the housing authority, right? That have, that those, uh, those that live in, in with uh, vouchers and are, are also affected because not 100% of their rent is paid by the housing authority. And so the, the portion that's due by them you know, cannot be paid because of these circumstances. So there, there's also that effect. So the housing authorities of, of cities around the Dallas-Fort Worth area are asking landlords, of course, to, to help out to, to communicate with their tenants uh, to avoid eviction. Uh, so that's, uh, that's real important. So is there a difference uh, between federal mandates and local jurisdictions where they have their mandates? Do those supersede the, the federal guides? For example, um, to your point, if you are on a voucher program or grant program, if your landlord is uh, through a federally subsidized housing prog uh, financing, um, if the a rental home or the apartment building is financed by a federal agency or mor federally mortgage-backed security, do those supersede the, the jurisdiction? Um, guides, the local jurisdiction guides. So uh, I'm not I'm not sure on that. I would have to speak. We have a um, uh, a lawyer on staff that would be able to to answer that question better. But I do know with uh, the housing authorities, local housing authorities, those are covered um, through through HUD and, and the CARES Act in terms of their protections. So uh, they definitely were were hit hard um, in terms of the employment composition where those where those residents work. Uh, are, are more than more often than not work uh, in those industries, but they had the uh, extended uh, moratoria through uh, the CARES Act. But uh, yeah, in terms of of um, the legal question of you know federal versus local and what what rules matter here, I think right now even even speaking to lawyers, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's uh, anticipating a lot of uh, you know litigation to. 
um, in response to these policies and, and you know, individual uh, mayors and cities uh, in their responses. Sometimes courts are, uh, you know, justice of peace courts, courts in Texas where eviction cases are, are uh, heard, um, you know, sometimes judges are making uh, these decisions. So there's a, there's a lot going on right now. It's unprecedented and um, complicated and uncertain at the moment in terms of what we're doing and what we can be doing or, you know, legally can be doing and what the implications of that are. So if you're in a certain area, don't just take a, a uh, just don't take somebody's word that something's happening, your neighbor across town or a different state, uh, find out for yourself because it may not be the same. That's pretty yeah, much what I'm know, getting. That, that, I think that's, that's great advice. That's difficult to do because, uh, you know, people aren't used to doing that and, and, uh, you know, having resources and knowing where the resources are. But I think uh, as a first step, looking, um, you know, contacting either your, uh, you know, your representative, local representative, whether it's a city, uh, city council member or, you know, um, just someone that that uh, is in more of a position of power that that is uh, making decisions that are, are affecting you. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about un unemployment in your in your paper. You mentioned that more than 400,000 Texans filed for unemployment insurance. Uh, and that was in March. So I'm yeah. sure that number has has uh, has increased. What can you tell us about uh, about that uh, as far as how it pertains to to this subject? Yeah. So well, um, it it has increased. I, I, um, I think through the third week of July. Uh, I, the initial unemployment claims um, exceeded three million in Texas. So we've, uh, the, but the good news is the pace has slowed down a little bit. Um, so fewer Texans are filing for initial unemployment uh, claims or for unemployment claims right now. But uh, we also track continuing uh, unemployment claims. So you know, not just the initial, but how many are staying on there? How are people able to to uh, rebound and get a job after going on unemployment? And right now. Um, that number, the continuing claims, continues to climb. So while you're seeing a slowdown in initial claims, that might be partially because there's, uh, you know, not a lot of people left who whose jobs are vulnerable that haven't already been laid off. Um, so, so while it's a bright spot slightly there, overall we're still dealing with a lot of um, a lot of difficulties in the labor market. And as I uh, mentioned before, these are are highly concentrated in. in uh, you could characterize them as renting renter household industries. Obviously, it's a composition of both renters and, how, and homeowners, but industries that have a high proportion, high concentration of renter households. And that's continuing on as we speak. And that, and, and that's because, I mean, and, and also the additional uh, $600 that, that they were receiving on top of their unemployment benefits uh, also expired. Yeah. So, uh, and right now, policymakers at the national level, at the federal level, are, are discussing possible extensions there. Um, but at the moment, you know, August rent was already due, and uh, that that benefit wasn't there. That support wasn't there. Um, so that's another challenge. Uh, even even outside of just the dollars and cents coming in, uh, just the uncertainty of knowing, you know, are if you're going to be able to, how you can adjust your budget. Uh, one thing that I want to emphasize. Another issue with evictions, you know, we mentioned earlier uh, difficulties through the screening process for future rental applications. Mm -hmm. Another um, consequence of an eviction is it's uh, detrimental to your, your credit score and, and to credit access. Well, right now, one thing that can save people, this, this may have long-term consequences, but if someone is, is faced with, you know, charging something on a credit card or paying their rent, um, you know, they, they may shift, shift their budget so that they can have more cash to pay rent. But but uh, if you if you have a lack of credit access and you don't have that option to uh, you know to charge um, other expenses other necessities like food and uh, then that creates even more difficulties and and, um, and really challenges households. So this uncertainty, this budgetary uncertainty, with not knowing are you going to have another six hundred dollars from uh, the federal relief or is it going to be two hundred dollars? That has implications not just you know directly but also how you're going to budget and and um, for the next month. Now I know some of the uh, CARES Act programs uh, or part of it has, has expired on July 24th I believe uh, and some other at 25, on the 25th so um, 
until the 24th, your, your, your landlord was not able to pr- give you a, uh, what is it called? A that was the moratorium the mor- you're talking about? Well, yes, the moratorium. Mm-hmm. So they weren't able to, to send you a 30-day a notice to vacate or an, an, uh, yeah, notice to vacate. Um, what happens now? Now that did they somewhat, uh, are they extending that portion until they can actually decide? Or so, is it a hard stop? Well, uh, well, first, so what it, um, what you're referring to, I think, is the three day notice to vacate. So that's how the eviction process days. begins. Is the the landlord before anything happens in court, uh, before an eviction is filed, the landlord has to um, provide a three day notice to vacate to give the tenant an opportunity to uh, to move without any you know without involving the courts. So I believe in terms of, of the uh, the CARES Act, that's where the moratoria uh, moratorium was set. So um, starting on that day, the 24th or 25th, those vacate notices were able to go out. And then, um, but there have been extensions. Uh, So FHFA uh, extended this through through August. So that's, um, so that applies to uh, mostly single family housing uh, for GSE backed single family mortgages. Uh, HUD provided similar protection for FHA insured mortgages. So so you're seeing kind of the components of the CARE Act that were covered on the CARE Act. They are providing some extension, uh, extended protection through August uh, yeah. that may apply also to those multifamily, multifamily properties that um, have federally backed mortgages. So, so would, a, would a VA loan uh, and a USDA loan also have the same type of protection since they are also government backed loans? I, I believe so, that they would be covered under those extensions through through August. And again, so uh, there's been a lot of confusion because there's so many moving parts in terms of where's the moratorium set. So, the, uh, you know, the latest looked like at the federal level through the care where this federal protection was preventing an eviction, um, uh, a notice to vacate. But uh, again, in other jurisdictions, um, you know, for people, for properties that aren't federally backed, um, finance or federally backed mortgage, it may have been said at, you know, you can file your, your eviction peti- uh, petition. The court's just not going to hear it until, you know, moratorium's over. But those are slight intricacy- intricacies that could matter uh, a, a lot in this process. Thank you. So uh, actually there, you know, there may be a, a, a backlog in, in the courts and we're, you know, we may not even know about it. And so that's the, uh, that is so crucial that we know that there's, that it's something's going to happen and it's going to happen big if our uh you know if if our government doesn't uh doesn't make a decision on uh extending it or having some more relief so we're going to take a, another break and um we're talking to Wesley Miller and he will give us more information when we come back from the break. If you'd like to join the conversation or ask a question, our number is 214-431-5032. And we'll catch you on the other side of the break. Hey, this is Leticia. And this is Matt. Catch us on the Reba Show every Tuesday from 2 to 3. On our show, you'll be able to hear from the experts everything about home ownership. Tune in on Tuesdays at 2 on the Blue Stream. On FishbowlRadioNetwork.com. Jump in. Hey, I'm Leticia. I've been a realtor for 15 years, and we bring you information from the experts. And I'm Sal. I'm the co-host. I'm a loan officer for the past 20 plus years. And we're with The Reba Show, homeownership Herod from the experts. And here on The Reba Show, we bring experts in the respective field to give you information as to the home buying process, if you're uh, sustaining your home, or if you're looking to sell your home covering all the industry, lenders, realtors, title company, escrow officers, insurance agents, all volunteering their time to bring you information that you can use. 
Our guests are experts when it comes to home ownership, whether you're buying for the first time or whether you're maintaining or sustaining the home you currently have. Or selling. Home ownership, hear it from the experts in the Blue Stream. Jump in. Programming for The Reba Show is proudly underwritten in part by the Arlington Tomorrow Foundation, contributing to a thriving Arlington, and in part by the Texas Association of Realtors Housing Opportunity Foundation. Funding is also provided by generous donations from listeners like you. Hey, this is Leticia. And this is Matt. Catch us on The Reba Show every Tuesday from 2 to 3. On our show, you'll be able to hear from the experts everything about home ownership. Tune in on Tuesdays at 2 on the Blue Stream. On FishbowlRadioNetwork.com. Jump in. Hey, I'm Leticia. I've been a realtor for 15 years, and we bring you information from the experts. And I'm Sal. I'm the co-host. I'm a loan officer for the past 20 plus years. And we're with The Reba Show, homeownership here from the experts. And here on The Reba Show, we bring experts in the respective field to give you information as to the home buying process, if you're uh, sustaining your home, or if you're looking to sell your home. Covering all the industry, lenders, realtors, title company, escrow officers, insurance agents, all volunteering their time to bring you information that you can use. Our guests are experts when it comes to home ownership, whether you're buying for the first time or whether you're maintaining or sustaining the home you currently have. Or selling. Home ownership, hear it from the experts in the Blue Stream. Jump in. Programming for The Reba Show is proudly underwritten in part by the Arlington Tomorrow Foundation, contributing to a thriving Arlington, and in part by the Texas Association of Realtors Housing Opportunity Foundation. Funding is also provided by generous donations from listeners like you. Hey, this is Leticia. And this is Matt. Catch us on The Reba Show every Tuesday from 2 to 3. On our show, you'll be able to hear from the experts everything about home ownership. Hear it from the experts live from Fishbowl Radio Network at Globe Life Park, Arlington, Texas. Thank you for listening. My name is Leticia Gallegos, co-hosting today with me. Salvia Lobos. Thank you. And our special guest is Wesley Miller today with the Real Estate Center at uh, Texas A&M. Wesley, you've shared some really great information for our listeners. Our topic today is residential rental protection and COVID-19. We are smack in the middle of this pandemic. It's, uh, it's sad. And uh, I know you all are just frustrated. You don't want to wear your masks. You want to get out. Uh, but it's real. It is really real. And I pray that you have not had any uh, anything happen to you and your family, stay safe. Uh, but we want to bring you this information today because um, rental properties, if you're renting, you, you need some uh, resources. And if you haven't reached out to your city uh, for rental assistance, uh, do so because uh, they've received... Uh, a lot of money to be able to help, and I'm sure you have to be patient when it comes to to seeking this kind of assistance because uh, I'm sure that they are uh, just bombarded with a lot of people that are hurting, that are that have been unemployed, have um, been laid off, and they and and uh, just be patient and uh, and we'll get through this. <laughs> so um, so Wes, you've. Uh, Tell us about what you've heard as far, for example, in Houston. What what are what have the, what has the little aftermath been on this? Yeah, so um, 
I'm, we've been able to obtain uh, eviction data from Houston, uh, from Harris County specifically, and uh, you, we've seen a collapse in eviction filings, which is exactly what you uh, you would expect. Um, uh, they're, I think they're down uh, almost 80% relative to, to last year in the number of eviction filings. So, uh, you know, what that could mean is, is what you alluded to before is, is uh, these could just be prolonged and uh, we could have a flood of eviction filings and, and flooding the court system and constables um, uh, with the with this process as soon as the relief uh, dries up. So that's that's something that policymakers are definitely they definitely need to keep in mind. And, and you know, the difference between just a temporary Band-Aid and and, you know, actually trying to mitigate some of the, the negative effects from this situation. Yes, because I've read also that that there were issues with late rents even before COVID. And yeah, so, yeah, tell us. So that. Uh, in, in Harris County, actually, um, they did observe a, an increase in eviction filings um, in January and February before before any of this uh, occurred. So then 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 the filings collapsed and they've stayed down uh, through the first week. You know, first couple of days of, of August as well. But yeah, so uh, it's difficult to tease out in, in those beginning months what was happening, but uh, they were observing a, an increase in evictions to start the year before this. Yes, and then the moratorium came, yeah. and so there they weren't able to file. And so that's what, that's what the worry is, uh, how this is going to affect uh, that you know, there's disparities and and disadvantaged communities, and you talked about that earlier when when you shed, said uh, when you talked about the shutdown, Wes, how it affected. Yeah, so uh, just just looking on on average, of the um, you know the different demographic, um, the dim different demographics of homeowner owners and and renter households, uh, renter households are more likely to be minority uh, households. Uh, I've already emphasized the the industries that they that renter households um, typically um, are more likely to work in, and those have been hit especially hard uh, from the pandemic. But also in terms of, of income levels, as you would expect, um, income levels are sometimes uh, twice as more for homeowners than renters. Uh, I don't have data specifically on, on Austin, but in uh, San Antonio in 2017, the the average income was sixty-eight thousand dollars for homeowners and thirty-eight for renters. Uh, you know, so a substantial difference there. Contributing to the income differences, there's also um, educational attainment differences. Uh, so all these factors go into play in terms of not just the immediate impact, but uh, renter households may struggle. They may be at a different part of their life, uh, be young, their younger households, um, and they may struggle to to react and be as flexible when faced with economic hardship. We talked about uh, uh, access to credit potentially being an issue. So all these things play a role. And, and again, we're speaking about averages here, um, but the average renter is uh, you know, going to struggle uh, to, to be flexible and, and be able to shoulder some, uh, some of these challenges uh, than the homeowners. So they're making ha le uh, less than half in some cases, but the expenses remain the same or higher for them, uh, possibly because they may not have the same... Uh, services or stores in their areas yeah yeah i mean it's just it, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis on that in terms mm -hmm. of indi individual expenses but um we just know that you know renter households given the the lower uh level of educational attainment or the stage of life that they're in they may be less less dynamic and be able to to be flexible when faced with economic challenges Exactly. So there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, definitely a lot of uncertainty in this time. And um, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it affects everyone. It really affects everyone. So uh, communities, it affects families, uh, children. This is, this is going to have a long-term effect. Uh, don't you agree, Wes, that, that this, is, this is what we're in right now, but the effects will be long-term? Yeah, I mean... Uh I, it's difficult to tell, you know, we, we've, this is unlike anything uh, that we've seen before, obviously, but anybody that's, that's been alive. Uh, and another thing I want to emphasize is, you know, if we, en if we enter, uh, um, you know, a deep recession, uh, a lot of times it's thought that 
one way to handle this for for new households or, or younger individuals is, you know, that uh, recession usually boosts uh, college uh, and educational attainment. And, but right now, given the situation, the nature of, of, of the pandemic where, you know, we've got a whole schooling issue on how are we going to handle education and schooling, that part of the, of the equation is uh, completely unknown and uncertain right now. Um, you know, people might not be incentivized to, to get additional schooling or pay more for online schooling. These are challenges that, you know, universities and schools from, from kindergarten through, you know, higher ed are dealing with and uh, that add challenges. Again, uh, you know, if your option was unemployed or go to school, that equation gets or that decision is, is muddied by uh, this uncertainty of, of school safety and if schools are even going to be open. That's a really great point. Right. Very, very good point. So um, we have, I, I want you to know, listeners, that we have key resource links on our website. If you'll go to our website, hrebaconnect.org, that's rebaconnect.org, right on the home page, uh, we have links that, uh, that we've put on there to assist you, links like um, unemployment, uh, if, you've, if you just got laid off and need to file for that, uh, emergency assistance resources, uh, child care information, uh, immediate jobs. I mean, there's, there's, when I saw that immediate jobs available due to COVID-19, I, I was surprised that there actually are jobs available during COVID-19. And um, other benefits, uh, SNAP, uh, WIC, those assistance programs, there's links on our website that you can uh, look at to find the assistance that you need to get through uh, through this uh, terrible time that we're in. So um, I'm going to ask Wesco a question regarding the, uh, you kept referring to Texas Tenants Union. Is there an organization that helps tenants uh, with certain resources or uh, information uh, direction of who may assist them, or is it a just informational uh, data uh, program or agency? Um, I'm not certain on that. I, I uh, believe that I, I've read that the Texas uh, Tenants Union will provide um, is uh, is one resource that tenants can use. Uh, you know, if they have questions, uh, given the the circumstances of you know steps to take and what and what to do, but. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. I haven't uh, contacted them personally. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, here at the Reba Show, listeners, we inform and we serve. We bring you information about home ownership, whether you're preparing for it or sustaining it. And during this time, you know, we also want to bring you information that's crucial for this, this time that we're in. Our hope is that you will engage with us here on the Reba Show and become a loyal fan of the Reba Show, so please make a note to listen every Tuesday at 2 here at fbrn.us for the podcast or f Facebook Live on our Reba Show Facebook. Um, again, I, uh, our guest has been Wesley Miller. Uh, Wesley, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. We really, really appreciate you. Of course, anytime. I really enjoyed it. Great, great. So uh, we, the, Reba, the Hispanic Real Estate Brokers Association, is a registered 501c3 nonprofit corporation. We've been streaming live on Facebook. You can see a replay of the video on the Reba Show Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel where you can subscribe to see future videos. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, like I said before, this episode is also available on a podcast on the Reba Show page at fbrn.us and also on our webpage, rebaconnect.org. So uh, if you like what you hear, you make make a donation. We're all, we don't say no to donations to continue funding this programming and other community outreach efforts that we have. Uh, so if you have any specific questions, don't hesitate to email us, rebashow at rebaconnect.org. Again, Wesley, thank you for being here. My name is Leticia Gallegos. Thank you for listening. Have a great afternoon, everyone. See you next week. Hey. 
Hey, this is Leticia. And this is Matt. Catch us on the Reba Show every Tuesday from 2 to 3. On our show, you'll be able to hear from the experts everything about home ownership. Tune in on Tuesdays at 2 on the Blue Stream. On FishbowlRadioNetwork.com. Jump in. Leticia. I've been a realtor for 15 years and we bring you information from the experts. And I'm Sal. I'm the co-host. I'm a loan officer for the past 20 plus years. And we're with the Reba Show. Homeownership, hear it from the experts. And here on the Reba Show, we bring experts in the respective